The perfect NEOS project setup. Um, why this will be interesting, this answer is very easy. Because all of us, we have, let me say, challenges sometimes in NEOS projects. And maybe sometimes solutions. But for this topic, there is a guy who has the summary of all problems or challenges which all NEOS agency together has because if there's no chance to fix it, then maybe you even called him already because at his company all the challenges from NEOS projects come together. Please welcome the chief nitpickler from Flow Native. Please welcome on stage, Karsten Dumbekans. It's always the issue with jingles that they are always those five seconds too long. It always feels awkward. Um, hello, good that uh, so many of you did not fall asleep after the break and need to kind of do their digestion break. Um, yeah, the, the perfect NEOS project setup, that's that's the title. Um, and uh, that is that is my name. It's a bit complicated, so I, I spelled it out there. Um, and uh, the company I work at is Flow Native, and we do a lot of, uh, you know, we are not an agency, so we work for a lot of agencies and have seen a lot of projects. That's why we have accumulated um, quite some insight into the real world issues that uh, people like you have with NEOS. Um, as you've seen with the uh, ongoing investigation into the F-files that Christian presented, there's really quite some stuff to learn. Um, so it's the perfect NEOS project setup, um, which probably is the title that brought you here, but in reality it's not that perfect. It's probably, I mean, Maybe it's just, <laughs> well, okay. Uh, it's what I consider a good setup. Um, obviously, as with a lot of things, when it comes to you know life choices in general and development choices and technical uh, decisions in particular, um, it can help to switch off your phone, but uh, sometimes you just you know can't find the best solution. Um, so the, the term best, we also discussed this during the sprint, um, earlier this week that the term best practice is a bit problematic because it's always depending on the situation and the what you have available in resources and so on and so on. So uh, sometimes it's really, yeah. Uh, so the best situ situ uh, solution or the silver bullet that we are all looking for doesn't exist really uh, most of the time, um, but it's always good to keep your brain moving and to try out new things. Um, and to take anything, even stuff that you um, would doubt works, um, at least serious enough to, to consider it, to think, okay, maybe that's a suggestion um, that I could look at from a different perspective, um, and it may help you in the end. So uh, project management. So because a project is needs to be managed, um, no, don't worry, this is going to be short. It's basically just two things because I'm not a project manager. I don't do project management. Um, but there are two things that I really recommend you to take up um, because it, it is so much more fun for me to work in a project uh, if you do it right. Um, and one thing is uh, content first. Uh, you may have heard me ramble about this in the past. Um, the thing is a content first approach. It, it can be rather difficult to sell to your client or to your boss, or to your colleagues, or anyone, basically. Um, but since NEOS is, if, if, if you know enough of it, it can be used to, to develop things iteratively in a relatively high speed. So you can really implement ideas quite fast. Um, at the same time, it allows you to do things in a very custom way um, while doing it clean. So it's not that you develop a prototype for something really customized that you have to throw away. You can go from what you have and take it further. Um, so 
if if you if you have that technology, um, you can actually ask yourself, or your client can you can ask your client who is it that you want to reach with the content you're having. So uh, and this assumes obviously a content centric project. If it's just you know I don't know uh, ticketing or bookkeeping. Well, I mean, there are also things that your customers want to do and uh, you might want to sell them specific stuff, but you know, bookkeeping is not content driven as such. Um, but what are the goals of the people that we want to reach? What do we need in terms of content and how can we um, kind of build that content and then create customized content types um, and, and, and really do away with unstructured blobs of text, you know, just you know, text fields within the rich text editor. And as you've seen um, with the things that Dimitri presented just before the break, um, there's also no more excuse in the, in, the, in the sense of, yeah, but you can't inline edit the dates really. No, you can. So that's good. But still, I mean, if, even if you plan the, the, the stuff, uh, things will change. Um, the, uh, I don't know, available resources might change. or way more uh, likely your customer will change their mind and say, yeah, well, we do it different. Can we change it here? Can we change it there? So try to be agile. Um, it's not like, uh, well, let's do sprints, then we do scrum or uh, yeah, Kanban, and then the project will just, you know, turn out perfect. Um, it's a mindset. It's It, it can be challenging. Um, uh, you should have listened to uh, Sven Ditz talking about real project management and no waste in, in projects, but that was at 11.45 this morning already, so I'm too late with that recommendation. But, you know, try to get things uh, going in, in the right way um, so you don't have to worry about the project management part anymore and can focus on the following things, and that's where it probably gets interesting for you a bit more. Um, First of all, I, I, I split this a little bit in terms of, of the general topic, and let's look at development as such, as in, you know, getting actual code written. The thing is, you need to know the documentation. Um, there's a lot of documentation, and still I often hear people ask questions again and again, questions that have their answers in the documentation. Um, and I'm, I'm not assuming that it's just laziness. People don't like to read documents. I mean, it's a fact that most people don't like to read documentation. Um, I do, actually, and I'm a bit weird in that sense. But it, it could just very well be that you don't know that there is documentation for this or for that. So um, make sure that you know that there is documentation. There's the official manual. It has installation requirements and, and configuration um, documented for Flow and for NEOS, specific parts, the parts that apply to both. So um, make sure to know that documentation and actually look at it, maybe even in a kind of proactive way, not as in, uh, what search term would I use to find the solution for that in the documentation now, but just you know, scan the table of contents and l use it as bad time literature instead of feeding Goethe or Heine or I don't know. So. Um, and then there's this, this uh, yeah, can Fluid do this? Is there an eel helper for that? How do I do this in Fusion? Yes, we have tons of references. Um, so this is you know, the beginning of the references section for the NEOS documentation itself. And, and, and as you can see, there's actually you know, property editor reference, view helper reference, Fusion, eel helpers, flow create operations, NEOS commands, validators, signals, coding guidelines, well, OK. It doesn't really fit. Node migrations and and configuration. So, and in the flow docs we have uh, you know uh, predefined constants and everything. So if you wonder, is there a helper to format dates in eel expressions? Check the eel reference. If it's there, then it exists. If it's not, then you read the next section on you know implementing your own helpers. Um, and talking about implementing stuff, we have an API documentation that even some of the core team members don't know where to find. Um, but then again, the core team members probably look at the code anyway. But there is neos.github.io, which has API documentation rendered for um, all the versions that we have, not only the ones that we maintain, but even the really old ones. And uh, we have this nice list of deprecated things and to-dos, so you can 
laugh at stuff that we have deprecated two years ago and it's still in there even though we wanted to have it removed and so on. Um, next up, know your options. Um, and by that I mean know that there's configuration options for a lot of things. I mean we favor convention um, over configuration in Flow and in Neos. So when you put things in the right places, it will be found. You don't need to configure a lot, but you can configure still a quite, a, quite a number of things. Um, those of you who watched closely realize that there's no uh, configuration uh, reference, um, but still you can find all the options that we support by looking at the defaults. Because the basic rule is, um, if there is an option that Neos or Flow understand, it has to have a default value in the settings file. So just read the settings files um, of the packages in the framework and in, in Neos. Um, and most of the options actually have a really helpful comment. And uh, if someone of you has some spare time, we are still having that dream of a tool that reads these comments from the YAML files and generates reference from that. So if you're up for that task, uh, hit me up afterwards, um, and then we can set you up for developing that. So look at the existing settings files. And then, of course, sometimes there isn't an option and you read the API documentation, but you don't want to or can't implement something. So know your ecosystem basically means if you want to, if you need to have something implemented, but you can't do it yourself, maybe just check the package search on Neos.io, check the uh, check packages. There are actually 218 packages that depend on Neos, for example, on packages, which is quite nice. Um, there's probably the stuff you need, more or less exactly. So you can just, you know, if you know what exists, uh, you can do it. And if it doesn't work right away, just try to collaborate. Ask for existing solutions. Ask for some someone that wants to collaborate with you on a package, on a solution, um, or, you know, just on a general idea. We have this discussion forum, so collaboration is always good. It's a win situation for everyone. Uh, then in your project, stay focused. Um, implement what you need. Um, try to, you know, not do things before you actually need them. And uh, if you if you found a really cool package, uh, as suggested on the slide before, but it's you know doing only 10% of what you need, plus I don't know a ton of things that you don't need. Maybe just don't use the package, but take the parts that you actually need and put them in your own package. Uh, as Dimitri also said, do the customized solution um, and, and make it work perfectly for your use case instead of some half-baked uh, thing. And one example that might come across as a bit uh, controversial is um, not using Neos node types. That's something a lot of, uh, especially core team members, uh, do. And to some of you, this might come across as a bit of a crazy idea because you know it comes with the core system and it's the, ne the nearest node types package. Uh, except that we already exploded it into base node types uh, and made most of that mix-ins so you can actually reuse that a little bit um, more fine-grained. Uh, and instead of using our idea of the perfect headline element, you know maybe you don't need headlines as such at all, so why have it in the system? Uh, because that means you need to disable it so the editors can't create them if they are not supposed to use them and so on and so on. So uh, do your content modeling, the content first thing, uh, and then create your own stuff and maybe not use node types at all or our node types package. Then obviously you write tests, right? Who writes tests? Yeah, yeah, I mean, um, this is this is I mean it, the 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 test name calling you returns correct class that's that's not the original class name that's something that I put there in the example I don't remember what the actual test was called um, but I have actually seen things like this in in real life so and and what does this do it it I mean you can't overload the new operator in PHP except Flow does, but uh, it's a different story. Um, so this was a plain PHP project some, some, some time ago, and there was actually tests for new returning what you instantiated, which is like a test for does PHP behave correctly? And I, I, 
Um, so let's maybe rephrase that to write useful tests. Um, test what you what you what actually makes up your API. Don't strive for more or less meaningless goals like we need 100% code coverage. Uh, because yeah, I can write tests that you know test all of your code, but probably miss some important parts of your API. Anyway, um, so try to write tests that really benefit you. Um, and then after you have written all your tests uh, for dessert, you need to do the dishes, obviously. Do refactorings. Don't be afraid to throw away code. You know, don't, don't comment code. Get rid of it if you don't need it. I mean, if you ever want to go back to that beautiful half-baked half code that you had last month, you all look it up in version control or whatever, but you know, don't just leave it there as comments. Um, Follow a coding style, document your stuff, get the names right, and so on. This is just you know, a, a, a really stupid example of code that you see quite often in real life. Um, and, and there are, it, it, it could be a, a kind of a, a, you know, a, a, a Suchbild or whatever. You find the mistake picture thing. Um, because what's wrong there? Yeah, there's an unused uh, use statement. There's a, a parameter type missing. There's even a complete method argument missing. There's mixed indentation down here. I had actually had a hard time pasting that tab into my editor to make that screenshot because it usually removes it right away. Uh, there's a weird name here, V, what's that? It's like, pff, well, okay. Uh, then there is this commented thing. So, so th the basic idea is it, it should look rather like this. And, and even here, um, if, if it was my code, I would actually not call it chunks R because it's not pirate PHP. It's not chunks R, right? It's a, I don't know, array of chunks or exploded string, maybe, but not chunks are. But anyway, this is better than before already. Um, I, I don't know, how, how many of you are thinking, yeah, I do all that anyway, you know, give me something interesting. I hope that, because I've, we've seen all that in, the, in, the, in real life, uh, that it, it might be something that seems obvious until someone else says it and then you realize, oh yeah, 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 I, we should do that. So um, I, I hope you get something from this. So learn and understand is also a very important topic. You can get a long way um, by doing, you know, the classic development style of, of uh, following. Th actually, th this is an actual book. I mean, it's not printed, but you can actually read this. Uh, I think it's on LeanPub or something. Um, with actual advice from the real world, uh, inspired by this uh, cover that that found its way onto onto Twitter some time ago, so you can do a lot by you know searching for problems, finding solutions that you then apply. Um, but eventually, it really helps if you understand what you're doing. I mean, you know what the what the code that you copied does. Um, and I have a nice example for that, and that's Fusion. It has been mentioned already um, that there are some pitfalls there. And, and f at first, Fusion is really like, oh, whoa, this is like, I don't know, I, I don't get it. It's really, it sometimes, you know, it works here, but if I copy this and change the name, it's broken and it doesn't output anything and it leaves you scratching your head. And then you, real you suddenly are at this point where you go like, oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> now I got it. Yeah, I have Fusion array. I can just, you know, put things there. It's an array. Uh, except no, um, and and then uh, yeah. <sighs> so that's when you really should be at a point where you say, okay, now I need to sit down, I need to take an hour or two, or maybe only half an hour, and and read up um, and and look into things. Uh, in this case, it would be like, yeah, node types and prototypes are not the same, and there is auto-generated fusion code going on. And then uh, since you uh, read the documentation, you've probably come across the prototype generator setting and you're like, oh, yeah, yeah. And then you look up the default generator that we have in NEOS and then you understand and then you can, you know, go from there. So uh, sometimes you need those deep dives to get things really into your head. So keep learning. Um, Adopt new things, question your own best practice, because it might be only a good practice. Um, and also for us and the team, and also for, for us as a company, there's constant learning involved. Uh, and sometimes the things that we 
consider a bit strange are actually working out very well uh, in real life. So we sometimes also change our minds and so take the time to do that. It's really worth it. Next up, development environment. That was all about this development environment, basically. So what you need to do in your own brain. Um, but then you sometimes uh, you need some ways to get that knowledge and those ideas and all the stuff that you understood and, and you know questioned yourself about out into some form of code or architecture or whatever and into the machine. So you need some tools. Um, and there are actual studies that show that developers are more content with their workplace. They are happier when they are allowed to choose their own tools. Uh, it's like bring your own device kind of thing. Y if you've always done Vim uh, and, and you would have said, well, you can work at Zeitgeist, but pff, you need to use Word. I don't know, would you have, you would probably not be working at Zeitgeist. Right, so that's what I mean. Um, so, so developers, are if you're if you uh, able to choose your own tools, you're happier. So that's what we are gonna do. Um, and we start, yeah, you know, I just trust me. Um, we start with a an, with an quite old discussion, um, and that's, no, uh, this one, um, IDE versus editor. I mean, <laughs> when you come up on stage and have a little fight, um, it's, as I said, do your own judgment. Um, but this, this, for me, the question is answered by using IDE. Um, it's not that I do fire up an IDE for you know editing a single settings YAML file. Uh, there are things that I just do in TextMate, for example. Personally, I still use TextMate too, even though it's been in beta for the last seven years or something. Um, and I tried Sublime and I tried Atom and you know, but there are still there are use cases. I I do use Vim uh, and Micro, and I've been a diehard Emacs user for some years. But it's it's like when it comes to PHP coding uh, or Neos development, um, for me this is what I want to use, um, and it's not just because it has a dark theme since the last release or something, but because you know I can navigate through the code. I can go to any class or any symbol by clicking or using a shortcut. It has syntax highlighting. Um, I can refactor things. I can I can extract code into methods, and it will say. Yeah, you want to replace the other three occurrences as well. I can rename a variable. Uh, I can rename a class, and it will be renamed throughout my full code base. Um, I can go to a test. Uh, I can have Xdebug integrated. Um, I can run Docker and npm and Grunt uh, from there. Uh, I can do SSH deployments from there. I can open a terminal tab in there. I can do my database uh, work from there. So really, this is what an IDE does for me, everything, and I don't have to kind of search for some, I mean, if I go to the persistence magic aspect, which I do once in a while to, to look things up, um, still being the, the persistence guy for flow, um, all I do is I hit a shortcut and then I type perm A, and then I'm, I'm there, because I know that, you know, perm persistence magic aspect, and, and it finds it for me with four keystrokes instead of you know typing all the name and or navigating or whatever. So for me actually PHP Storm uh, is the go-to PHP IDE. Uh, it's uh, and also for a lot of other people I know. Ac actually for I mean if people use an IDE in my surroundings then it's PHP Storm. Uh, it costs money, it's not open source. Um, I'm not kind of an evangelist. I don't get money for this fr from them. We buy our own licenses like everyone else. But it's really, really a good investment. And then there are uh, two things that are, you know, it's it's 0 0.5 of them are actually uh, cost money uh, of those two, uh, in a way. And uh, these are really highly recommended. So now it's really an actual useful suggestion for some of you, maybe. There's a Neos plugin that you sh if you if you use PHP Storm for Neos development, install this plugin, like right after the talk. Um, because, you know, then you can even navigate eel and fusion structures. You can uh, move to a template from a fusion file with a single click, that kind of thing. So really, really good. 
Um, and then there's this Fluid plugin, which works for Type of 3 Fluid, for our Fluid adapter variant. It's basically independent of the, of the system behind it, as long as it's Fluid. And it also does syntax highlighting, navigation, and so on. And if you have the paid version, it even has the syntax highlighting and error detection for inline Fluid syntax, which is really helpful if you have like nested things in inline Fluid with all the escaped quotes and stuff. So I th that's really, you know, error detection for that case is cool. Who of you uses ZSH as a, sh as a shell? I, I guess the others are probably bash. I don't know. I just log in, which is fine. Um, uh, if you are using ZSH, then you are probably also using oh my ZSH, which because, I mean, if, you, if, you, if someone tells you try ZSH and you Google it and you go to their website, you're like, I'm not going to use that because their website is really uh, horrible. But oh my ZSH, that's that's actually cool. That's what I what brought me to to uh, to ZSH. And there is a nice helper, uh, the Flow Framework helper for ZSH, written by the guys at Sandstorm. I mean, they are doing uh, most of the cool stuff. And that's really you can you can just go in and and uh, it has code uh, auto completion for Flow commands. So you can just you know tap complete uh, migration generate. If you tap again, it shows you the the help text for that, um, and it uh, you can go to a different directory and call flow commands from there. So no more dot slash flow and being in the root. You can do it from wherever you like. I could have typed faster a bit, uh, whatever. So just to to show you that again, you're in a different directory now, and I can just still call flow. So that's really, if you do flow stuff on the command line uh, and you are using ZSH, you want this, uh, this uh, plugin. Um, and it can even run unit tests from wherever you like, so you don't need to remember bin PHP unit minus C build, build essentials, PHP unit, unit tests XML. You just call fun it test, and then it has all the fun with the tests. I think it's F unit test, but it's more fun if you think it's fun. So that's... That's their plugin. Uh, as Christian said, URLs and slides are stupid, but I mean the slides will be uploaded eventually afterwards, so you can just y then you can actually click on them as well. So then, then who of you uses version control? Okay, there are I don't know who does not. Okay, who's not doing any code that should be everyone that did not raise their hand because you know use a version control tool. This is an actual screenshot from an actual server. Um, well, th the, the broken pixels are mine, obviously. But uh, you see this uh, update, before update, update one, Neu. And then before node repair, node repair, we had that. But before node repair, like, you know, yeah, fixing, copying the code before node repair is only, you know, pff, you should back up the database. But anyway, so this is like, Yes, on a server that can't do backups currently because the disk is full almost and they can't get a new disk. And but anyway, so if this is what you do to your code, uh, no. <laughs> Version control is not optional. End of story. Yeah, I mean, there are companies out there that don't do that. I mean, that still... I, I can't even, well, whatever. Okay, technology. Uh, has been mentioned, use the newest version of PHP. There's no reason not to use the newest version of PHP that you can. And that means 7.1 or 7.2. Um, all our releases work with 7.1. Everything we currently support works on that. So um, there's no reason, um, So and, and PHP 7.1 will be required by the next release. Um, and 7.2 is already available and stable and so on. So uh, if anyone tells you, well, yeah, we can't update because, you know, there are some other systems that still need PHP 5 on the machine, then first of all, yes, why can't m m multiple projects on the same server use different versions of PHP? Question one. Question two, or rather point number two is, yeah, 5.6 and even 7.0 are in security fix only mode by now. They are not getting any more security non-critical bug fixes. So yes, this 
is what you need to show your hoster, boss, client, whatever, and then you know get them updated. And if if needed, you know I don't know, make an analogy to, yeah, are you still using Windows XP? And then if they look embarrassed, then <laughs> you you've driven home point. Um, and and if it doesn't help, then tell them, well, PHP 7 is faster than 5.6, and 7.1 is faster than 7.0, and 7.2 is faster than 7.1. It saves you resources, and resources equal money in a lot of times. So uh, yeah, just get them to update. Stay update. And that should not only be about the, the PHP side of things, you know, the infrastructure on your server, which hopefully does uh, someone else for you, but also Neos and Flow packages do regular updates, uh, do Composer update regularly. Uh, make sure to not fall behind too much um, because it makes it more manageable. You can actually go in and read the change logs of the two or three patch levels that you are pulling in now as opposed to half a year of updates and who knows, it might break, uh, phew, I don't know. It'll maybe we can push the update back a bit more and then you, you know, it's not getting better, it's getting worse. Um, and then of course also check security. That's even more time critical, so um, maybe try to automate things. Um, I mean, Flow and Neos updates, we announce them on Twitter and discuss. Uh, and uh, I don't know, does someone announce them on Facebook? I have no idea. Um, uh, and in the discussion forum. Um, but there are more packages involved, obviously. So um, there's uh, just recently announced Symfony Security Monitoring, which works for anything that's in the Sensio Labs security database, so any package that publishes their information to that database, um, including Flow and, and, and Neos packages and anything that we depend on, or you roll your own using the security checker from Sensio Labs um, or the uh, security advisories package, which ties into Composer update cycles. So um, you can also create your own thing. And then look into other technologies, look into Redis for caching, look into Elasticsearch if you haven't, um, uh, I don't know, Postgres, because it can even gracefully handle errors in doctrine up migrations, which MySQL doesn't. It just, you know, you can't encapsulate uh, data or de schema changes in a transaction in MySQL, which is a shame. Um, and, and, you know, those kind of technologies, even if you can't use them right now, if you have tried them, if you've played around, if you've read about them, they might help you in the next project. Yeah, it works on my in the sense of it is it is sometimes helpful to be able to actually pull a project to your own machine to debug it or to develop it further, as opposed to on the live server or whatever. And then, uh, so so for me that meant for quite a while I had a, a local um, setup on my Apache uh, and an Apache on my Mac installed using Mac ports. I had a DNS mask setup that routed anything dot dev to localhost, and I had a name-based virtual hosting setup. Beautiful. It, it worked all the time, uh, and, and I could just, you know, clone any Flow or Neos project, create a database, uh, maybe set the file permissions, and then hit the directory name as .dev, and by now it's .test, because as you know, dev is now a proper domain. Um, and it was working. I could debug things. I could just import the database. Now, sometimes you have this project where you need some extra tool or it's in a different PHP version, then you need to switch, which is possible but tedious. And then, you know, all the stuff had the same uh, environment. So that was a downside of that. And the first time I saw this, it was shown to me. And I thought, like, yeah, that's cool. You can run this strange whatever based on some esoteric language package on your machine to try it out. Nice. But pff, what do I really use it for? Um, and, th and, and by now, um, more and more of the projects that I do, um, I am, I'm actually using Docker to, to do that and Docker Compose, uh, since that provides a way to really easily set up the stuff you need. You know, your specific PHP version Maybe a Redis and an Elasticsearch uh, and, you know, mount things and do stuff and you can have that all in parallel. Um, so, you know, this has less RAM, but this has Elasticsearch and so on. Uh, and it allows you to put a Docker Compose file into, for example, the Neos IO website, which you can also find on GitHub. And then we just define there, okay, this is the web server, this is the PHP uh, FPM running and this is the sidecar that you can use to actually go into the docker thing and, and run your commands and this is the database and so on and so on 
Um, and with this, it's even it's kind of the 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 it it complements uh, the composer log file because it it says this is the environment that these packages run in. Um, so uh, and there's a lot of variables in there because it's it's modeled after our uh, uh, internal kind of setup thing. Uh, so what we do is we uh, oop, that looks interesting. Huh. Um, so uh, this is this is uh, the script that we um, have alongside. This was the script that we have alongside. It's a shell script that you know does the composer up and then copies the stuff into the machine. And from there, um, during development, I do an auto deployment via SFTP from my IDE into the Docker machine. So no mounted folders because that had speed issues for quite a while. Um, and if you're interested in that setup, you can you can just look in the Neos IO website. Uh, distribution on GitHub. Um, it's all there for you to check out. Unfortunately, one or two of the Docker images used in there are not public yet, so you can't actually try it, but I guess that will be fixed in, in due time. So when it comes to your local development environment, make yourself comfortable. Uh, again, invest some time in that, uh, into that, because it will make you more productive in the end. If you constantly need to to fiddle with things and ask around for, yeah, it worked on my machine because, and then it's different for the colleague and even more different on the production server, then it, it, that's actually a waste of time and not sitting down for a day maybe and setting up something that you can reuse in every project. Managing dependencies. Who has no problems managing dependencies in their project? Impressive. You need to tell me about your small project. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because actually, I mean, this is what you all have without even knowing, maybe. That's just the Neos development distribution. And, and for, for real life, it, it looks even worse because we have this one thing here, this development collection of Neos. I can, I can use the laser pointer on the left side as well, or right side for you. This, for you, will be multiple packages, so it looks even more impressive. Maybe I should generate it from that next time. Dependency management. Fortunately enough, we don't have to do that. We have this uh, composer thing that also Christian mentioned earlier, uh, the composer with the conductor logo, as everyone always points out. It's the dependency management, and it has a beautiful interface. Um, you can really work with that. Well, I can. I, I, li I like the shell. Uh, it can be intimidating, so there's a relatively new project called Composer Cat, um, which, well, you know, it, it does the stuff that you can also do on the shell, um, but especially the check for upgrades is even a bit more helpful than on the shell. So, uh, Composer. Um, what you need to know about or when using Composer is semantic versioning, the basics of it. So look it up on, on, on this uh, semver.org website. Uh, understand patch minor major and when it is theoretically always safe to update um, and then understand the constraints and then maybe also uh, I don't know maybe you don't know this tool which is the packages semver checker tool which uses the resolution um, mechanism that's built into packages so if you ever wonder if pulling in I don't know uh, this weird version constraint string caret 1.0, what would it pull in? You can just go there and, and enter a package name um, and a version or a dependency uh, constraint, and it will show you in green which of the existing versions it would use. Really helpful tool. And then as has been pointed out earlier today already, add composer lock to your version control. Composer lock is not optional. I can understand that it's confusing sometimes because I recently wondered why in my Neos development there was suddenly a package lock JSON file which I had never seen before. It has something to do with JavaScript. Why isn't it versioned? Why is it not in Git ignore if it's not to be versioned? You know, questions. But for this one, I can tell you add composer lock to your version um, control and remember that install and update are different things. Install installs what's in the log file and update updates what's in the log file. So keep those things separated. <coughs> and from separated to keep things together, um, 
sometimes you have a project that has a site package and then you have a library package for something that you need to and then you have maybe an import tool and so on and you have three or four git repositories for that and you have a distribution repository and then you change something and, and then you commit it and then you go to the repository uh, or to the to the distribution and then you do your composer update and then you need to update um, or commit the log file change and push it to your server so the test server can pick it up because otherwise the change in the sub package uh, will never make it to the test server and so on and so on. Um, so why not move the stuff into a single repository? Um, that makes things easier on the development side, but it creates, as has been explained, dependency chain uh, problems um, and the loading order stuff. So uh, that's not my timer, I guess. I have still a few, a few seconds left. Uh, so if if this is what you um, what you have when you put things into the same uh, into the same repository and just you know uh, all require them from the root manifest, it's different from this, which is what you actually want. Now, if you put them in the same repository as has been explained you actually do this so it's installed and and you do the other thing so neos knows about the dependency order so um what we by now are doing and recommending uh is not this because a lot of commits and tedious and you know you, you always have these one change only the composer lock commits in the root thing this reduces it by 50 percent which is good um and this one reduces it even more because you only need to commit if the dependencies of the packages in the same repository actually change. So um, this is how it looks like. The bright red <laughs> folder icons. No. Um, these are actually, I mean, I mean these are <laughs> obviously very small packages. They don't even have code. But it's the point um, that these are even excluded in my IDE. This is where the actual code comes from. This source directory um, is used as a path repository for Composer. So Composer will, from the top level Composer JSON, see that I want B and that B needs A and it will install those packages into this uh, packages folder via a symlink and pull in any other dependencies. So this is really, really helpful. And at the same time, um, it, it solves your dependency um, chain and loading order issues because if you declare it uh, the correct way then it will also be found magically um, and uh, you this one here says um, uh, where's the oh, repositories down there uh, URL source slash asterisk so you can even use a wildcard there and put multiple packages just in there we will make this a way way easier in the in the near future I hope um, and then you will install or create a new project based uh, or flow or neos based project using this it doesn't work right now but it's uh, it's halfway there uh, you can you can join in and help um, so that we will have this really nice tool to create such a repository layout for you automatically so uh, consider dependencies um, not a necessary evil but i mean they are part of your project that's that it's the stuff that does most of the work for you to be to be honest managing configuration L not looking at the loading order of packages but we have uh, configuration overrides so you have what's in your package and then uh, you have the global configuration and then we have context specific settings the application context one of the many contexts that we have um, and it's really helpful to use that to discern between settings for your development machine and development context and for a production machine uh, but sometimes you have multiple production machines um, so you can have application subcontexts. you can nest them you can have a production staging and a production life you can even have a production live uh, node a and node b uh, so uh, you can go ahead and, and have different whoops different settings for development and for production staging and for production live so you can have the conflict free settings um for i have two more minutes says my timer <laughs> <laughs> um so uh you can you can have settings uh for your development machine and for the staging thing uh without having them collide with each other and having you 
having the need to remember to uncomment the actual sending of mails to the client when you work on your machine, because you don't want that. Um, the downside is that sometimes you log into a live machine and you, you s just start some flow command and you see this and it's like, whoa, everything is broken. Um, no, probably you just forget to set the flow context variable. So um, define flow context on all your servers. I mean, don't require your developers to log in and then export flow context production. You know, have it rolled out by your deployment strategy. So configuration is code, that's the basics. Uh, treat it as such, you know, treat it with care and give it, show it some love. This is going to be relatively quick because this is the part that even more than anything else depends on the actual needs. Um, but automate your deployment, be it surf, be it deployer, whatever, to the point where you on your machine can just type one command and stuff is deployed somewhere else. And then take the next step and automate the automation of that so that you don't need to type the command anymore, right? I mean, you want to push code somewhere and if you tag uh, a, cur a state, then it should be rolled out to some testing server. That would be, wouldn't that be cool? Or if you tag it, it should actually go to, to production. So use whatever you want, Jenkins, Travis CI, GitLab, CodeChip, uh, CircleCI, you name it. It depends on what you want. And where do you deploy to? To your hosting, obviously. So that's, that's simple. Uh, no, it's not simple. It's simply the most asked question. Can you recommend a hoster? It depends. They're simple. Which is like, if you're technically inclined and you like to do things uh, and it shouldn't be really expensive and it's a small project, why not do it on things like Uberspace? It's working. I mean, it, it runs Neos just fine. Um, and then there's always the option for managed hosting, obviously. Uh, you just need to be careful that, that uh, I mean, it can be pro-server by .de, the friendly guys out there. Um, or it can be uh, some of you, some of the, the team members use all inclus all inkle.com, which is also a great name to pronounce. Um, just make sure to check that they can actually run the stuff you need, uh, like have SSH uh, access maybe. Then you have the option of going the complex way, like yeah, DigitalOcean and then running it there on my own machines and deploy and provision. Um, you can ask uh, Dimitri about running Docker Swarm on bare metal machines. Uh, he's, he's doing that for his production requirements. Um, Johannes Stoy later will talk about running your own Kubernetes cluster, which is you know, very, very interesting um, as a topic. And then you have, of course, you have nightmare hosting, right? I mean, we've all been there and done that. It's like, yeah, the, the, the CLI binary is available, but it's not called PHP. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, how do you find out? You look at the log files, except you don't have permissions to do that. And then you, you ask the support, and they send you the log files, except the line that you actually need, and so on, and so on. So it's really like nightmare hosting. You don't want to do that. So these are the hosting options. You can, of course, also do the scalable Kubernetes without having to learn all the stuff. Um, which is what we always wanted, and which is what we did. And if you shameless plug over ask us about it any i mean there are two of us in this shirt one has robert on the back and the other is me uh, and then christian who uh, refuses to wear anything but a proper shirt uh, can also tell you about it so um and if you have any questions about this or if you have suggestions or if you have really strong disagreement uh, you can't ask now i'm afraid because i'm two minutes over time but uh write me an email hit me up during the day and, and tomorrow, um, write an email and maybe even follow me or and or the company on Twitter because I think I will write down this and more into probably a series of blog posts um, because it's really a topic that is important. Okay, thank you. <laughs>